hand to begin uh, the next panel shortly. Uh, the panel is uh, chaired by Professor Jimmy Adeshina from uh, UNISA. And uh, rather than three panelists, we have two panelists. So they will get a bonus uh, of time to present. I'm sure they will use it uh, judiciously, even if sli slightly more than they prepared. So let me hand over to Jimmy uh, for the next one and a half hours. All right, okay, thank you. That obviously means that uh, you miss your uh, coffee break. Okay, um, you know, let me, you know, welcome everybody back. Uh, and I think as far as uh, turning the key to the conference goes, uh, this, this panel uh, probably sounds more like a, um, a keynote panel, as, you know, uh, given the conceptual oversight of, of the thematic focus of the, of the conference. Um, and we have uh, uh, two eminent, you know, members of, uh, of, the, of the community. Um, we will start with uh, uh, Professor Fatima Harak, uh, but I'll refer to you as Fatima, just, you know. Um, and I, as many of, many of us who will, of course, know that uh, uh, Professor Harak is uh, a former president of the council, um, and was uh, between 2003 and 2008 the director of the Institute of African Studies at the uh, Mohammed V University in, in uh, Rabat, uh, Morocco, um, where, she, where she's also a titular professor, um, a historian and a political scientist. Uh, Fatima trained at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques uh, in Paris and the School of, the o of Oriental and African Studies, uh, University of London. Uh, she served on the scientific committee, if I remember, you know. Um, and uh, um, on the executive committee as, you know, vice president, and as I said earlier on, subsequently president of the council. Uh, Professor Harak has been a visiting scholar at several African, European, and North American universities. Uh, author of several books and numerous studies which appear in Moroccan and foreign scientific uh, journals. Uh, our research covers the theme of uh, Islamic reform movement, uh, slavery in the Moroccan-African relations, and women in transmission of learning in, in the pre-colonial North and West Africa. Uh, so um, as far as uh, historical overview uh, goes, I don't think you, you can be in safer pair of hands. Uh, Fatima. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And uh, thank you, uh, Goodwin, also for uh, suggesting that I take part in this uh, first panel, uh, which is a great responsibility. I hope I, my contribution is going to be worthwhile. Uh, let me start. So globalization as interconnectedness between peoples, between nations, between ideas, between cultures on a large world scale is something that is not new. I think we have to admit that f at first even if today's globalization uh, has a, a speed to it that is a little bit exceptional. But globalization, as coined by Western media and academia since the mid 80s, is another sort of globalization. Before the advent of globalization, there was the oracle of uh, the end of ideology and then the end of history. Uh, and before globalization studies, there was world system analysis. So at the beginning and at the center of all these descriptive and prescriptive concepts or pseudo concepts 
the global, the worldly, uh, uh, and before it, the modern. We've lived through the discussion of modernization. Is the Western model that is being sold to the rest of the world. So today, globalization as Western hege hegemony, or hegemony, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, now it can even be narrowed to US and Anglo-Saxon Anglo uh, hegemony, is viewed as a form of Western universalism, i.e. the latest version of the white man's burden. The East or South being considered as irrelevant to the making of Western and global modernity. The globalization discourse of the uh, Anglo-Saxon hegemon, now called also, there is a new uh, uh, term uh, or formula that uh, it has been uh, uh, also commercialized, a rule-based order, it reiterates daily that while this uh, order is graciously providing and paying for international public goods, the rest is ungraciously free riding on the hegemon's largesse. This is a discourse that we are you know, receiving every day. So we have not really finished with ethnocentricism, uh, Eurocentricism, uh, the critique of uh, this a historical ethnocentric ideology has taken a long time and went through several uh, rounds. We remember the Edouard Said and uh, uh, his struggle against the cultural bias and the racism embedded in Eurocentric history. Other thinkers critiqued the Eurocentric biases in development. Our regretted Samir Amin has spent his, uh, his life doing that. Uh, Eurocentric bias, uh, uh, biases in historiography, and we have Jack Goody and, and Eric Wolf who have done that too. Subaltern studies have made critical assessment of history, which they revised from the viewpoint of the global south. But I will stop at uh, global history or one tendency within global history, which has also uh, uh, contributed to uh, bringing in uh, the rest of the world into, into history, if you like, and which considers that uh, contact and exchange among civilizations and not clash among civilizations is what, dri what uh, drives human history forward. Uh, and uh, this uh, trend of uh, world history has generated critical historical studies that recognized and documented the contribution of Asia, uh, the Africa and the Middle East in particular in the making of global economy and a global history. The discipline of global history critiqued the embedded Eurocentrism of the Western social sciences, but it also overturned the conventional perspectives by developing the thesis of what they called oriental globalization. We can call it also globalization by the rest of the world or globalization of the South, uh, which in their point of view preceded Western globalization and hegemony, thus implying a profound rethinking of world history with all the repercussions that ha this ha could have on social sciences and development studies, and I will just give the names and some of the basic works that have uh, illustrated this point of view. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, William McNe McNeil's uh, uh, monumental work, The Rise of the West, A History of the Human Community. Marshall Hodgson, The Three Volumes, The Venture of Islam, Conscious and History in a World Civilization. Uh, other world historians and social uh, scientists include the anthropologist Eric Wolf, most known for his Europe and the People Without History, uh, the sociologist Janet Abulurud, uh, whose monumental work is Before European Hegemony, the World System Between 1250 and 350, 
the sociologist uh, uh, Nedervin Peters, who is still uh, 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 with us and who has written extensively, I, I, I note here his uh, 2012 article, Periodizing Globalization, Histories of Globalization. Uh, the economic historian and sociologists André Gunther Frank uh, on the one hand and Barry Gills who edited uh, this monumental work also, The World System, 500 years of 5,000 years, questioning uh, 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 the uh, world, uh, his, well, world system uh, analysts theory. And the political scientist and international relations scholar John Montague Hobson, whose uh, major work, The Eastern Origins of Western Civilization. So there are people here who are thinking about uh, uh, from, issued from the West, but thinking about what preceded this Western rise. Uh, so um, this school set forth that Europe, Asia, Africa are not continents with separate and independent histories and civilization, uh, this fiction of Orientalist imaginations, but uh, these edges, instead of edges or fault lines, these are really zone of contacts where civilizations came into mutually constitutive dialogue and exchanges. This is a big shift from the conception of the international, the global, the worldly, Western provincialism and a move towards a more global dialogic conception of inter and trans, trans uh, civilization and relation, relations, which grants agency to both East and West, North and South in global production and transformation. Uh, the traditional Eurocentric linear narrative usually starts with 1492. Uh, date of the expulsion of the uh, Muslims from Europe and the opening of the new trade road which was supposed to be India but ended up to be America. So Europe was trying to, to join in this pre-Western uh, uh, world system if you like and it happened to arrive into the Americas. So th this is the, the date which is symbol of the rise of the West. Uh, and then this uh, narrative progresses forward through a long line of European imperial uh, uh, global pioneers like Portugal, Netherlands, Britain, etc., culminating, of course, with the, uh, uh, with the Pax America being the uh, extreme form of globalization uh, after 1945. So uh, world historians on their part argue that globalization and the global economy or world, world system, if you like, emerged way before 1492. Uh, Janet Abulurud uh, singles out the 13th and 14th centuries. Others push, push it back to the exile age to the 8th and 3rd centuries before, before uh, the uh, common era. So in this long durée uh, vision, the years uh, 500 to 900 of our era are considered as watershed because they ushered in what world historians identified as this oriental globalization. It was during this period, according to these scholars, that global relations became very intensive and very extensive. And this was the result of two major developments. The emergence of a series of interlinked Eastern empires uh, and the rise of Islam. These critical uh, regional empires included the Tang Empire in China, the Islamic Umayyad and Abbasid empires in Western Asia, the Umayyad polity in an Andalus in Spain, and the, the Shia Fatimid uh, dynasty in, in North Africa, which all of these take us up to the uh, the 15th century in a way. So the Eastern world system was also uh, favored uh, by the revival and expansion of, of camel transportation between 300 and 500 and this is how trans-Saharan trade also enters uh, uh, the world system 
uh, uh, through the introduction of the camel. Between 500 and 900 then, global economy was centered in the Middle East, where Mecca constituted a global uh, trade hub, linking the Indian Ocean trade with Asian continental trade. And uh, it's in this context that we can see also the rise of Islam, Muhammad, uh, trade, uh, Mecca, uh, uh, and Islam. This is uh, the linkage in a way. By 1875, Baghdad had become a hub of world trade with China and India, and the Middle East remained, in fact, a bridge linking Asia, Africa, and Europe throughout the second millennium. During this period, and up to the 19th century, according to these global uh, historians, the world trade uh, uh, was organized around three major circuits, uh, to, to which was added as an annex, in a way, the American, the transatlantic uh, uh, gold trade. Uh, uh, the first uh, secret was a Western European Mediterranean circuit, which profited from the Crusades, but remained tangen ten tangential to the system, especially after uh, uh, the end of. Uh, uh, rule, Muslim rule in, uh, in, uh, in Spain. A Middle Eastern one which dominated both land trade in the Central Asian steppes and Indian Ocean trade thanks to, to its overland connections through the Red Sea and through the Arab Persian Gulf. And a Far Eastern secret of trade that connected the Indian subcontinent with Southeast Asia and China. These three major secrets were in their turn organized in interlinked subsystems within which smaller trading secrets and subcultural and political systems existed. Abulurud, uh, Janet Abulurud counted about eight subsystem secrets for the 13th and 14th century. So this Afro-Eurasian world system was woven together by major trade routes, transcontinental and transoceanic. Uh, and uh, the picture presented of this trade by Janet Abulurud uh, is uh, very interesting. Uh, it's, uh, she, and I quote her, uh, this pre-modern global order was a long-standing, globally integrated world system to which Europe strove and succeeded in attaching itself to only after the 14th century and only as a marginal member. In this world system, I continue the quote, <coughs> in this world system, three or four core areas where a variety of cultural systems cooperated with no single cultural, economic, or imperial system as, his, as being a hegemon. So, uh, the distribution of economic power within this system was polycentric, uh, and even if in terms of extensive and intensive global power, the world of Islam dominated approximately from 650 to the Mongol invasion uh, in the mid 13th century, uh, China would, uh, from the 14th up to the 19th century, would dominate this trade instead. Indeed, alongside China, Islamic West Africa, West Asia, North Africa, as well as India and later Japan, maintained high levels of intensive and extensive global power down to the 1800s, with Europe remaining a smaller player in this vast Afro-Asian trading system. Uh, these interlinked regions promoted an extensive, pacified, and non-hegemonic space that fostered considerable trade and enabled the transmission and sharing of what Hobson called an Eastern resource portfolio of values, institutions, ideas, technologies, etc., some of which, uh, uh, from which everybody uh, profited, including the, European, the Europeans, and among these sources, the banking techniques, 
the navigation and nautical techniques uh, with which uh, uh, Columbus traveled, uh, discovered the world, uh, uh, the uh, weapons uh, deployed by the Iberians, gun, gun, gun powder, guns and cannons uh, uh, developed in, in, in China uh, well before uh, the ninth century. Uh, Muslim and Chinese ideas enabling the enlightenment and uh, Chinese agricultural and industrial technologies enabling British industrialization. Uh, some uh, of these scholars even talk of the industrial miracle of, uh, of China uh, uh, from which Britain uh, was inspired for its own industrial revolution. Some other features of, uh, of uh, these pre-modern oriental globalization or uh, non-Western globalization uh, include uh, preference for peaceful means of conflict resolution, although wars were not really uh, uh, absent totally, but uh, I, I can just give an, as an example, uh, the Umayyad Muslim empire, uh, which had only one limited military confrontation with the Chinese Tang uh, empire in the seventh century, and which led to a signing of a peace treaty which uh, 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 never was discontinued compared to the intra-European uh, colonialist, neo-colonialist and imperial wars which marked Western history between the 15th and the 20th century. Uh, another characteristic is the p peaceful coexistence and commerce that is relations of people of various ethnicities, uh, religious cultures, uh, uh, Within this, uh, within this system. Jews, Christians, and Muslim, for example, lived p peacefully uh, throughout the Islamic West Asia, as they did in Spain down to 1492, and throughout the East, from Alexandria to Malacca, a wide variety of merchants and trading diasporas resided and traded peacefully together. Uh, until the armed incursion of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean trade at the end of the 15th century, uh, trading relations had been peaceful and there was no deployment of heavy weapons in Asian shipping until the intervention, until the Portuguese uh, uh, imposed it in a way. So uh, if global history uh, between the 7th and the 19th centuries seem to have been essentially Eastern, or let's say non-Western, uh, it must not come as a surprise to us today to see the possibility of its coming back after, uh, in, the, in the loop of the longue durée, a brief Western uh, uh, interlude of 19th to the 20th century. So, after the catching up by, with the West of a number of countries from Asia and from the South in general, and the transformations of indicators of global wealth, uh, or global hierarchy of wealth in favor of, of the East and the South, uh, we are more encouraged than ever to uh, think of a counter hegemonic uh, uh, thinking, thinking in a counter hegemonic way. Uh, and scholars from both, and academics from both the West and the rest, uh, dare to speak today of the rise of the rest. Uh, the title of a, a book that uh, my, our colleague Jomo uh, has uh, uh, participated in is The Rest Beyond the West, uh, Mapping a New World Order. This is a 2017 uh, uh, work. So we dare think of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of a counter hegemonic discourse. So it is a platitude today to say that uh, uh, US world hegemony is in crisis. Uh, our regretted colleague Samir Amin would have said that it is in its terminal crisis. We miss him so much uh, today. In any case, it is clear that we have entered a long period of hegemonic breakdown and systemic chaos, the return to a non-hegemonic world order which profits all humanity 
will require thinking up a new approach to development, a new approach to man's relations with the nature, and a new approach to human interactions. Revisiting and consulting world history, or this trend within world history, and looking back at pre-modern uh, globalization or pre-modern world system affords an opportunity for us of enriching both our theoretical and empirical outlooks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was 22 minutes, 58 seconds. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, and we will have time to um, come back for the discussion um, uh, later. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Jomo, uh, as he's generally known. And uh, Jomo Kwame Sundaram has been part of the Cordestria family for years. Uh, and rightly so for a Malaysian whose father named him after Jomo Kayata and Kwame Nkrumah. Um, most recently, though not currently, uh, Jomo uh, you know, held the Tun Hussein on chair in international studies at the Institute of Strategic and Ma International Studies in Malaysia. Uh, he served previously as the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations at the um, UN DESA, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a street long achievement uh, there. And then subsequently, uh, between 2012 and 2015, as the Assistant Director General of the FAO. Uh, before joining the UN, uh, Jomo was Professor of Economics at the University of M Malaya. Uh, he taught at the Science University of Malaysia, National University of Malaysia, Yale University, Harvard University, University of Cambridge. Uh, and Jomo combines a prodigious scholarship with more than 100 authored and edited books with advocacy with a strong progressive edge. Um, he's a founding president of the International Development Economics Associates, uh, a progressive heterodox association of economists and some non-economists. Um, you know, at the last count, I believe um, he spoke, although he was telling me over breakfast, you know, that he lost control of some of these languages, 10 different languages. Uh, ranging from Malaya to English, Russian, Mandarin, French, Spanish, Tamil, and Indonesian. Um, it's a delight to welcome Jomo back to the council. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy, for your very kind words of introduction. Um, in, uh, when I've, whenever and I'm, I'm in Malaysia, I always say Malaysia has been enriched by West Africa for three major imports. Number one, the oil palm. Number two, the cocoa plant. And number three, uh, the reducing the time for salutations and introductions by saying all protocols observed. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation, ne nevertheless, to the Organizers, Codestria, I still am waiting for my PowerPoint. Is it up yet? No, I don't think so. Um, uh, anyway, uh, let, me, let me begin because we have very little time and, uh, and uh, we are running uh, late. Um, what I would like to, to discuss today is some of the discontents, the African discontents as a consequence of, of uh, uh, globalization. Uh, Fatima has, basic, has uh, kindly given us a very uh, a broad sweep of, of the history of globalization. And uh, I think uh, there's no need for me to cover any of that ground. Um, but I would like to be able to, to sp speak a little bit uh, to a few issues. One, I'm going to suggest that the African experience uh, of trade has essentially been one of comparative disadvantage. And secondly, uh, on the question of globalization, uh, we have seen a tremendous amount of capital flight uh, 
and the amount of aid which has been promised uh, has actually declined, relatively speaking. Uh, we are privileged to have uh, uh, the former president of South Africa, Tabum Beki, who chaired a commission uh, who, which reminded us of the significance of the hemorrhage associated with that kind of, cap of, of capital flight uh, from Africa and what, the, what damage it has caused uh, to the continent. Um, now, one of the great promises which is often proposed to us all is the promise of foreign investments, that foreign direct investments are going to come to the rescue, and I'd like to visit that question very briefly and finally conclude uh, with some brief observations of some equity aspects of, for the well-being of African peoples as a consequence of the recent experience uh, with globalization. I think it's not unfair to say that uh, the experience of globalization in Africa, or the recent experience of globalization, w was uh, first probably argued for, most influentially at least, by uh, Professor Elliot Burke from Michigan University, uh, who basically made the case in a World Bank, a report for the World Bank uh, in 81, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the liberalization of trade, finance, investment, and other flows but n very significantly not for the liberalization of labor flows. Secondly, he also made an associated case, not just for liberalization, but for its antithesis, namely for privatization, the strengthening of an extension of private property rights. Uh, and this, I think, is very important for us to recognize because this is very much part of the story of the extension of intellectual property rights and I think it is to the credit of the late Madiba that one of the things he did in, uh, with the prestige he had uh, as the first president, elected president of South Africa was to fight for the public health exception to the uh, intellectual property rights. M many people in Africa have had their lives saved by the fact of the public health exception to the intellectual property rights provisions of the World Trade Organization. So this is very important for us to recognize because much of this is being pushed back. In fact, as we speak, in recent uh, years, there has been an attempt to extend the extent, extend the extent of property rights associated with medicines. So much so that even naturally occurring substances, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, uh, insulin, uh, is to be privatized uh, with the new provisions for intellectual property rights being extended to what are called biologics. This will have tremendous implications, and if we have time, we, we should try to visit some of those issues. Now, let me proceed with the discussions of trade. I think there are three uh, dimensions of trade. Uh, sorry for looking around so much, but I'm hoping that there will be a PowerPoint uh, uh, put up soon. Um, for trade liberalization, I think it's very important for us to recognize the three arguments which are very, still very relevant, uh, although they were made more than half a century ago, about seven decades ago to be exact. Uh, first is the argument made, bra made by Hans Singer and then extended by Raoul Prebisch uh, at the end, in the middle of the 20th century and that is the decline of the prices of primary commodities compared to manufacturers. Uh, this, unfortunately, has continued to the present if we look at the long-term trends. Secondly, uh, we have the observation also around the same time of the late Arthur Lewis, where he argued that the prices of tropical agricultural products had declined compared to temperate agricultural products. And I, I, if I had the slides uh, show up, I will show you some of the recent trends in this regard. The third point, which is very important for those who think that, that uh, industrialization alone is going to make a huge difference, is the fact that as the rest, as, develop, as developing countries have increasingly begun to produce manufactured goods, we have seen the steady decline of the prices of manufactured goods being produced by the South compared to uh, manufactured goods where there are strong intellectual property rights. Um, now that we have the, uh, the, um, the 
uh, slideshow up, let me re uh, um, just mention the late Samir Amin and, and also our friend Sam Moyo, who has been extremely important in raising the issue of the land question uh, in this, on this continent. Let me quickly move on to, uh, okay, this is basically the, the, the slide showing you uh, commodity prices, uh, the trend of commodity prices in the, uh, in the, on the course of the 20th century, and then uh, tropical commodity prices, agricultural commodity prices in the recent period in the 21st century. Now, I think it would be uh, an understatement to say that the terms of trade for African products have generally are, are worse. Um, uh, of course, there are differences. North African products have perhaps been worse off compared to some of the others, uh, but generally this was the case in the late 20th century, and I would suggest that this has been the case uh, for the early 21st century as well. Now, nonetheless, despite all this, um, the evidence is clear, okay? It's indisputable. Nonetheless, uh, the World Bank made the claim uh, uh, some years ago that a new round of further trade liberalization would benefit uh, Africa. In fact, the studies which they commissioned could not show that. And if those of you who have time to scrutinize some of the tables, uh, you will find that the line for sub-Saharan -Sub Africa uh, in this uh, basically shows this. Now, part of the reason there has been a growth in sub-Saharan uh, African trade uh, is precisely because there is more trade within sub-Saharan Africa. Part of this, of course, has been due to the fact that, there, that the, the sanctions against South Africa have basically been dropped since the mid 19 uh, 1990s, but also there has been a tremendous expansion of trade with Asia, particularly with China and India. And this, of course, has been, has constituted a, a, a mixed blessing, if you will. And, uh, but it is important to emphasize that African primary export dependence continues to remain high. Um, going back to the World Bank study I mentioned earlier, uh, basically there is there are no net gains, even by the World Bank's own research, okay? So we're not say, referring to other research. There has been other research, for example, by some uh, French uh, agricultural economists who showed uh, that uh, uh, had much, uh, west, uh, much worse uh, prognosis uh, for African uh, agricultural commodities. But as far as, um, as um, um, the World Bank's own research uh, suge suggested, that this would be the case. So one of the major consequences of this, uh, as we all know, um, with the promotion of much more cash crop production for export and so on and so forth, has been the worsening of food security. Now the fact that agricultural exports from the north, especially from Europe, are heavily, sub heavily subsidized has never been a matter of, uh, uh, of much international discussion. So subsidies are considered okay, but tariffs are considered bad. Uh, so you have the case, for example, where African poultry production has been largely wiped out uh, by imports um, in initially from Europe and more recently from places like Brazil. Uh, like this, the same can be said of what has happened in the Americas and increasingly other parts of the world, uh, we see the same. Now, African uh, agricultural trade liberalization has been bad for sub-Saharan Africa, and the, the data shows this, uh, and other, this is some of the data from other studies. Okay. Now, the combination of agricultural subsidies in the north, the common agricultural policy in the past and new, and new versions thereof, reinforced by things such as the Lome Convention and so on, and, South, uh, and the, the agricultural trade liberalization which has taken place in the South has undermined food insecurity. So casualty number one, food insecurity. Um, now, uh, it's quite obvious that there has been significant uh, uh, investment in increasing mineral, uh, mineral production and mineral, mineral extraction and mineral exports. And this has been rising uh, for, for, for decades now. Um, and this, uh, nonetheless, you will, you, you will see later uh, that 
that, um, that it has not had very significant developmental consequences even when prices have risen. If we move on to look at the tariff biases, uh, we will find that there has been a significant erosion uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, with what, was, what is called the trade preference, uh, uh, tra trade preferences have gone down over time from the post-colonial period. There were different types of trade pre preferences in the British, former British Empire. They were called, first it was called imperial preference, then it was called commonwealth preference and so on. In the former French uh, Empire, uh, they have gone by different names, and, and uh, uh, of course, in the case of Portugal, it's not been significant, so we, we can forget about that. But the point is that all this has been consolidated and reinvented and repackaged um, in, in the uh, new dispensation uh, with, the, with the consolidation of the European Union and so on. Now, the second casualty I would like to suggest to you uh, has been deindustrialization. And later I'll show you some data to point, to emphasize this point that uh, African industrialization has basically been uh, undermined, subverted, reversed uh, since the 1980s uh, by trade liberalization. Um, some data is available uh, um, and, and, I, and the data goes from uh, 1970 to the year 2014. Just to give you a sense, if you look at the line for manufacturing for sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, you will find that the figure uh, um, uh, of manufacturing in 1990 was 11% and it had gone down two decades later to 8%. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the deindustrialization which has been taking place. You can also look at the uh, num num other numbers, but we don't have time to get into too many details. I referred earlier to the question of financial flows. And without going into too many details, let me emphasize that the financial flows uh, to Africa have been more than offset by capital flight. Some of that capital flight, as I mentioned earlier, is captured by the Mbeki Commission report, but there's also other kinds of forms of capital flight uh, which need to be taken into consideration, and we will look at some of these uh, in a moment. Uh, the next uh, couple of uh, slides give you an idea of financial flows uh, over the long term. It's very difficult to summarize them uh, it very quickly, so I'll just uh, skip these slides. But I think you will get the num you will get an impression uh, from the direction of the arrows and the direction of the lines. The the, sum the summation of all this is to emphasize that there have been net transfers out of Africa. Okay, net transfers out of Africa. And capital flight from sub-Saharan Africa is particularly serious. Uh, and ironically, uh, much of this capital flight has been facilitated, indeed financed by debt, which has been incurred by sub-Saharan African countries. Okay, please remember this. The how do you enable capital flight? by borrowing from abroad, okay? So private individuals take out their money, governments borrow. And basically there is a, a facilitation of this whole process as a consequence, okay? Now let me turn quickly to the whole question of aid flows. Uh, aid flows are indeed uh, extremely uh, uh, significant and I think it is um, useful to, to to, um, to consider uh, some of the, um, um, th that, that aid flows have been very notoriously unreliable. But they have changed rather significantly, especially after, uh, after the end of the Cold War. Because the end of the Cold War ended the justification to provide aid to keep people in the so-called Western camp or the so-called free camp of the free world whatever uh, that meant in political terms. And so there has been a great diminution. And, and of course, th these figures are l largely referred to aid uh, coming from the traditional donors, okay? We don't have systematic data on other aid. Now, one of the major problems, of course, is that uh, what is called aid quality is hugely problematic. 
the conditionalities which have been imposed have been increasingly adversely in the interest of, the, of African countries. There is much less space because of this conditionality. Uh, very often you have very high transactions costs. This, uh, the former World Bank president, Bob Zelik, uh, admitted as much when he pointed out that many government officials spend so much time entertaining foreign aid officials uh, that they have very little time to do their work. And as a result, they had to ha impose uh, 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 a limitation on how many uh, visits uh, aid officials from abroad uh, could make. Because the average amount of aid was all per, pro per loan tranche uh, or per, per project tranche was also going down uh, by, by more than 60%, close to 70% uh, over a, a short uh, period of about uh, a decade. There's been very uh, limited progress in terms of trying to improve uh, what is called aid quality. And what we find, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have uh, uh, pointed out that much of so-called bilateral aid uh, is tied. There is uh, ostensibly a great deal of interest uh, by Western publics to make sure uh, that the aid giving process is accountable. As a result, there's a keen interest, it is, it is said, uh, in that, and hence there has been a tr trend away from multilateral aid towards bilateral aid to, and to facilitate this public scrutiny of aid uh, to developing countries. So you have uh, very keen public scrutiny, and as a consequence of this, uh, we find that corporate lobbies uh, in these countries have insisted increasingly that the aid be tied so that the, corp that, that the national economies would benefit from the aid which is disbursed. And so you have, uh, you have uh, interestingly, what is supposedly in the interest of Western publics uh, actually ending up being of interest to Western uh, corporations. Uh, in any case, uh, it's important for us to recognize that the promises of aid uh, have, have actually uh, been matched by huge shortfalls. Every now and then, in the, at least uh, until re fairly recently, there was a promise of increased aid. Uh, I remember when I first joined the UN in 2005, there was the Glen Eagles um, uh, summit and there was a promise of increased aid and of course uh, very little uh, materialized from that. Um, um, most of the promises were not met, but to the credit of the UK government, uh, the, the UK government, uh, at least under Cameron, came close to the uh, uh, 0.7 of 1% uh, target, which was made uh, way back in 1969. Um, it's also interesting to compare uh, how much aid uh, has been, ODA, Official Development Assistance, has gone to Africa compared to what has been ostensibly in their own interest. The bar on the left uh, gives you an idea, this was the uh, uh, commitments made by the G20 countries, the G20 countries for their recovery, okay? This was, it came close to 20 trillion, okay? 20 trillion US dollars. Now, if you cannot see the line on the right for Africa, ODA to Africa, uh, it's not a problem of your eyesight, okay? <laughs> Uh, because it was 26 billion, okay? 26 billion was the number, okay? So we are talking about something slightly, uh, slightly, uh, uh, slightly over 0.1 of 1%, okay? So don't hold your breath expecting that aid is going to lead uh, Africa into development. Um, let me now uh, go back to the more general point about financial globalization. I think uh, for the first thing to recognize is that very, there are very few so-called emerging market economies in Africa. And there has been a net outflows from Africa. In, in, uh, there was a, a, a political activist uh, in 1960 who wrote a book uh, during the, du during the, uh, in the, uh, during the uh, late colonial period in Malaya. And he basically argued that this expectation that money will flow in rather than flow out of the country is extremely naive. And he compared it to opening a bird cage and expecting more birds to fly in than to fly out. 
You know? And this is basically the kind of, of thinking which goes into uh, expecting uh, with capital account liberalization that the more money is going to flow into Africa than to flow out of Africa. Um, in, in any case, um, it is important to recognize that the so-called market risk ratings are all pretty much biased against Africa. Uh, I remember some time ago, uh, Soludo, when he was uh, briefly the governor of, this, of the Bank of Nigeria, uh, hoping otherwise and being sorely uh, disappointed. Uh, let, moving on, um, it is important to recognize that financial liberalization, generally speaking, has not been developmental. And what we have seen is that it has actually slowed down economic growth generally throughout the world, not just in Africa, throughout the world. Secondly, it has undermined development finance institutions. Thirdly, it has promoted exclusive financial, in, rather, uh, fin uh, uh, financial exclusion rather than financial inclusion, and, uh, which, which the World Bank claims it would like to achieve. And fourthly, but not least importantly, it tends to be pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. What is the significance of it being pro-cyclical? Pro you basically want resources, financial resources especially, when, when, when things are bad, not when things are good. You basically want it when things are bad. So you want counter-cyclical finance, not pro-cyclical finance. Unfortunately, that's not how markets work. Markets tend to be pro-cyclical, so it exacerbates, it worsens um, the ups and downs of the economy rather than helps countries to manage um, economic upturns and downturns. Now, turning to the question of foreign direct investment, the fact of the matter is that FDI trends have not been encouraging for Africa. And even when there has been some FDI, a lot of it has been what is called brownfield rather than greenfield. What is brownfield, what is greenfield? Okay, if a foreign company, say, let us say Lafarge, discovers that Dangote is making money and they buy over Dangote's cement plant, that is basically brownfield. Dangote has already built the cement plant and then he sells it on. It does not build anything new. It does not enhance African economic capacities, okay? That is basically brownfield investment. So we find that about 80% of FDI in, uh, in uh, developing countries generally, and even higher for Africa, uh, for Africa, is actually brownfield FDI. And less than 20%, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I, I got it wrong. More than 80% is uh, uh, going into Africa, um, is consists of what I call acquisitions or mergers. I say acquisitions and mergers, although the language of finance is mergers and acquisitions. Why do I say mergers, acquisitions and mergers? Because most of the time when it comes to developing countries, especially in Africa, it is an acquisition, it's not a merger. Okay, so it is an acquisition. Of the remaining 20%, most of it is brownfield rather than greenfield. Okay, I'm sorry, I got it wrong with the first time I was trying to, to express myself. Okay, so the gains to, African, to Africa in terms of additional economic capacity are grossly exaggerated. Okay, so I'm not against foreign direct investment, especially if it is greenfield, and especially if it is in areas where the technology is not available to African, econ uh, to African uh, investors. But... This is very rarely the case. And the way China developed when it did not have that technology was precisely by laying down conditions for technology transfer. They did reverse engineering and they quickly learned and that is how China has caught up. China was not antagonistic to foreign direct investment but it laid conditions, strict conditions. And that, was how, that is also how the rest of Northeast Asia developed. In fact, the rest of Northeast Asia was more antagonistic to foreign direct investment. There was only 2% of gross domestic capital formation during the high growth period before the 90s in Japan, in South Korea, and even in Taiwan province of China came from, uh, from, from foreign, uh, foreign direct investment. 
The rest of it, more than 90%, more than about 98% actually came from domestic investing. Okay, so I think it's very important to recognize that this naive belief that foreign direct investors are somehow going to develop Africa is actually quite bogus and misleading. Now, moving on, uh, I think it is, it is uh, uh, important for us to, to, to recognize, uh, let me see, sorry, um, um, that there are, there are quite a number of other problems, but, but since I'm running out of time, let me run on to uh, pointing out that the African share of global FDI yeah, is about under 3%. Okay, and just remember that most of it is actually acquisitions. And of those acquisitions, and besides those acquisitions, most of it is brownfield. Okay, so just put that 3% in perspective. Okay, and most of the African FDI is in, you guessed it, minerals. Okay, so, and Minerals FDI is really not very developmental. Um, not only is it, um, it does not stimulate broad-based development, um, it does not create much employment, um, it, diversif it, it doesn't help to diversify the economy, and very often it does not involve much meaningful technology uh, transfer. Now, uh, looking at this question, um, um, uh, carefully, I think it is important to look at the recent experience of Tanzania. Okay, uh, if you look at the experience of Tanzania, in ostensibly under the what was it called the, the uh, mineral extraction transparency initiative promoted by the bank. Okay. Everything was supposed to be done above board so that there would be no corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the, and tax uh, tax breaks were given to foreign investors. So what happened? How much did Tanzania benefit from the? Tanzania became the number three producer after South Africa and go and Ghana. Tanzania became the third largest producer of gold in the in in, in Africa. How much did you think? Tanzania benefited from it, besides creating a few jobs? Well, it's a trick question, because the answer is negative. Okay? Because effectively, the Tanzanian government ended up subsidizing the foreign miners, mining companies. Okay? Because you provided the infrastructure and so on and so forth for these companies. I met the guy. I met the guy who was the head of the World Bank delegation. He was working in Rome, as, uh, working at a high level official in, in some UN agency also in Rome. And he proudly told me there was no corruption in, in Tanzania. I said, yes, yes, no corruption. That, that means you had nothing, you, the Tanzanians got nothing. Okay? Okay, not even the Tanzanian elite got anything, okay? the normal people who would, who would make something out of these deals, okay? That was the niche, that was his pride and joy, okay? As the head of the World Bank delegation responsible for this advice. He didn't deny it, he didn't deny it. Uh, now, I think it's important for us to recognize that, that you can have, that, that in, in most of the world, FDI, Foreign direct investment gener generally follows domestic investment. It rarely leads domestic investment. And public investment does not necessarily crowd out private investment. It can crowd in private investment. Okay, it's how it depends what kinds of investments you make. So it's very important for us to begin to think very carefully about domestic entrepreneurs and, and the relationship of domestic entrepreneurs to foreign entrepreneurs. It is true that many state-owned corporations do not have a wonderful history, okay? And we need to find ways to improve the governance of state-owned enterprises to make sure that they perform a, a, a better, better. Look at the 
the most efficient steel, produce, steel plant in the world. Okay? It is Bao Steel in the greater Shanghai area. It has been the, be the, most, uh, the, mo the most efficient steel plant in the world for the last two decades. Okay? And before that, it was preceded by a Korean company called Pohang Steel Corporation, POSCO, which was built against World Bank recommendations. Okay? So do not presume that state-owned enterprises are going, to be a, uh, are going to be a mess. You can run state-owned enterprises well. And this, the question is how you manage them, how you govern them, how you ensure all this. Now let, let us quickly review the age of globalization and what it has meant for Africa. It began, as you can expect, not, it took advantage of the fact that Mr. Volcker, chairman of the US Federal Reserve, raised interest rates at one point to, to, uh, to more than double digits, I mean, uh, sorry, double digits, uh, more than 20% at one, at briefly, and so, there were a total of almost a thousand structural adjustment programs introduced during the 80s and 90s in Africa, and the result was a, a lost quarter century in Africa. From the late 1980s, uh, sorry, from the late 1970s until the early 21st century. A lost quarter century. Okay? The policy conditionalities were particularly onerous huge cuts in public spending, credit restraints, etc., etc. I need not go over this list, which is all quite familiar to many of you. And, and at the end of it, sub-Saharan African trade balances barely improved. Okay? So it was a very painful structural adjustment with very few benefits. Very few benefits. Um, and not even in conventional economic terms, in terms of growth. Okay? And neither did you see a reduction. In fact, if you look at the figures, you will actually see an, a worsening in terms of volatility, of economic volatility, much more than in the rest of the world. Now, we have a brief period of improvement at the end of the 20th century for a couple of years. It ends very quickly. And then from the beginning of the 21st century, you have a period of growth which ends with the global financial crisis. But then you have a bit of a recovery until 2014. My, 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 my graph ends in 2013. Okay? And uh, in 2014, all this comes to an end uh, when the Saudis uh, push, up the, uh, push down the price of oil to try to deal with Iran and secondarily Russia and so on. So the result of it has been a period of impro economic uh, improvement, a period of economic growth at the beginning of the 21st century and uh, and um, I, I've been reminded that I've run out of time, so let me quickly run, run on to, uh, to uh, remind you that, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has done very poorly in terms of, um, I, I know I've run out of time, but it doesn't help if you stop the thing from working. Uh, can, can, you, can somebody just make sure it works at least? Am I pointing the wrong place? Anyway, um, I have another graph showing you that the number of poor went down least in sub-Saharan Africa. I have another graph uh, showing you that informal employment is highest in Africa and therefore the likelihood of decent work uh, 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 targets being achieved are, are very remote. And have another graph uh, which uh, looks at uh, world inc uh, income uh, distribution and uh, um, uh, and also uh, looking at life expectancy. Life expectancy has undoubtedly improved in many parts of the world, less so in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and we sh I also uh, have something to show that 
the, the risk of a child dying before his or her fifth birthday used to be nine times greater uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in 1970. Uh, half a century later, uh, it was 11 times greater. Okay, so things have, so, uh, you know, globalization has not meant convergence, but greater divergence. Um, and then I have a, n a number of graphs, uh, uh, pictures, which, I mean, this is a distorted view of the world, okay, in case you can see anything. And uh, basically, it shows you, uh, uh, or oh, at least if there was a picture, you could see something. But uh, anyway, uh, it shows you, it, it is a distortion of the map of the world to uh, reflect, uh, uh, you know, uh, life expectancy and various other things, okay? So you get very, very different shapes of the world. So this one is about mortality. So you can see Africa very highly overrepresented, okay? In terms of child mortality between the age of one and before you reach the age of five. Um, and then something else showing the maternal mortality um, uh, being uh, worse in sub-Saharan Africa and the uh, 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 disease of poverty uh, TB. Let me just quickly make, uh, because the, the theme of this conference is the crisis of globalization, I'm going to venture to make uh, three points about why we have a crisis of globalization today. One is the, the politics of the end of the Cold War, uh, the end of, uh, decline of ODA, the end of history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, secondly, we have, um, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, we have the end of the rise uh, sorry, the rise of the rest, okay, M largely referring to East Asia but uh, and South Asia, um, and basically the, um, the the capitalism versus capitalism. Okay, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's no that capitalism is the only game in town, but there are a variety of capitalisms, and we have to recognize that. And thirdly, and not unimportantly, I think we have a, a certain type of postmodern politics which has trickled down to the south. And particularly, the rise of identity politics has been quite important, and this has resulted in a greater uh, sensitivity towards tribalism, a renewed tribalism, um, and a renewed uh, sensitivity towards uh, religion, uh, and so on and so forth. And um, also, um, what this has meant in the north uh, is that uh, social democracy, as we once knew it, uh, has no longer doesn't play the kind of role it once played, and so we have a very different kind of uh, of uh, social democracy as represented by people like uh, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, uh, uh, Gerhard Schroeder, and so on and so forth. So the consequence of it is the kind of politics which I I would say unwittingly has uh, led to the kind of crisis of globalization which we are facing today, and this of course uh, poses new challenges. But I would like to suggest that there is a silver lining insofar as it provides, offers some new opportunities. Okay, these are the slides I was trying to describe uh, to you earlier. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, while Jomo is making his way up, uh, I'll ask I'd like to ask for a bit of indulgence on your side. Uh, we're going to eat a bit into the coffee break, but considering that we just came from lunch, you know, uh, I think the problem with conferences you get you get overfed, you know, uh, and it's happening on the very first day, you know. <laughs> I'm not used to three meals a day, you know, but uh, um, so we'll. we'll I'll, I'll, but, but, but not also, you know, impact on the next, which is the final plenary session uh, in a way in which it will, you know, disrupt the rest of the day. Um, so I would like to, we'll take one round of questions, uh, comments, very brief. I, I shouldn't be the one telling people not to be too long-winded, you know, um, but I'll make a plea just, you know, uh, set up your timer in your hand, and when you reach five seconds, stop. Okay. Uh, you know, so that we can have the 
you can have the, the what do you call it, uh, comments and then, f and then responses, you know. Um, I see three hands here, one, two, oh boy. Oh, yeah, yes, I saw that. Oh, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, all right, let's, 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 let's do it this way. Um, I've got three hands there, but I, I will need to plead with you, make very short, all right? Um, three here, two at the back, one. I just need to clear this up before you hand over the mic. Hold on, hold on. Um, here, uh, I see three hands and that, those two rows from that end, uh, you. So it will be one, two, three, four, five, six in the cup, seven, eight, and we'll stop. I'm sorry, you know, but we can have this conversation, you know, uh, otherwise I'm gonna end up with 20 people and we won't go, I do apologize, you know. So, um, very briefly, I don't have the power of cutting you off, so, no, 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 not him, he starts at the back. Not, who is, who is, no, 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 this way, this way. Yeah, the, the man with the hand up, you know, and then the person next to him and then down. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair, my name is Elijah Dickens Mshemeza from Uganda. My observation is uh, on the second presentation. The two presentations complement each other. Uh, Jomo observed that uh, the current trends in globalization have led us to say bye-bye to food security and the industrialization. I want to agree with him because uh, globalization has created conditions which make African states to desperately desire for uh, penetrating global markets and seek for foreign investments which leave African states vulnerable. I have observed in Uganda, for example, that Chinese are destroying our environment, growing rice, they're excavating sand and exporting to China. I see private companies exploiting our daughters and sons to the Middle Eastern countries in the name of searching for foreign capital and the testimonies which are coming from our daughters and sons are very worrying. Yet, African states, I believe, can mobilize domestic capital and attract foreign capital through tourism if they addressed governance deficits, including improving human rights and corruption. To me, these actions would provide conditions to mobilize capital for agricultural industrialization, for sectors like education and health, and these interventions would uh, work on negative consequences of globalization. Um, Briefly, if you agree with the last speaker, don't say you agree with the last speaker, just move on to <laughs> the next speaker. No, I don't speaker. do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just gonna keep it brief, like really brief. My question is to both pres presenters. My name is Madalito Piri from UNISA. Uh, for me, it seems like we need to be thinking about post-growth economics. Uh, Fatima spoke about the relation, a globalization of coexistence that existed prior to colonial modernity. Uh, so what necessary steps do we need to take to achieve uh, 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 th the a new imagination of capital itself? Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Very yes, brief. thank you very much. Um, the, the way the second speaker uh, presented Africa, uh, spe specifically um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, gives the indication or the impression that we have to go and bury Sub-Saharan sub Africa at once. Because there is still, there is still that there's no hope. Uh, the missing link now is what is the way forward? I know that you don't have time, but what is the way forward? What can we do to get out of this mess? Thank you. Um, here? 
This way, this way, this way, this way, this way. I have a question to Professor Jomo. I think uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, there is now uh, one of the problems of aid is that uh, most of the problems now are uh, project aid, but not uh, budget uh, aid. I was in interested in this uh, question because I think most of the co uh, emerging economies are providing project aid, but the Western countries provide uh, budget aid. And I think there's kind of a growing uh, consensus that uh, people think uh, uh, project aid is uh, more effective than uh, budget aid. Uh, I, I don't know if I understand well. And another question is about FDI. I, if I understand you well, you will think, uh, uh, you think FDI is not uh, very effective, but you are not against that. And, and I think uh, I agree with you. You mentioned a good example of uh, China. So uh, do you mean that uh, actually FDI is important to African countries, but the key is to, uh, to learn how to handle with the foreign investors, how to make uh, the foreign investment uh, more effective for African countries. But the message uh, uh, from your presentation might be a little bit misleading, and I also feel a bit uh, pessimistic because that aid is not effective. Aid is dead, we all know that, but also you mentioned the FDI is also not that effective. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the two at the top, well, not exactly top, you know. No, 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 the cap. Uh, thank you. I'm Shegun Adekoya from Nigeria. Um, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram, good analysis. Uh, the question I was going to ask you had been asked by somebody there, and that is, uh. The solution to the crisis of globalization in Africa. So now, I'm not going to ask you the question again. I'm okay. just going All to right. suggest <laughs> a solution, and that is, is a line from his song that says, I will be free when I can help myself. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next to you, next to you, next to you. No, 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 no. Thank you. I have two, two questions observation. The first one is that um, uh, I'm a little bit suspicious with the, the words and the categories that you use when you talk about African development. Uh, you talk about aid and at the same time you say that you have capital flow from Africa to Western countries and we know that we have more money from Africa and more reserve and more raw materials that come from Africa and that go in Western countries. I just want to say by this that one of the reasons why we don't succeed and will not succeed is that the conceptual tool that we use is obsolete. Uh, it's not your, your point particularly. We can, we can see it in different objects, uh, but uh, you know, we, we can prove that Africa is subsidizing, in fact, the rest of the world. And if we have that stand in terms of thinking, we will have more solutions and more uh, a new imagination like that guy was saying. I observe, my second observation please, is that you didn't talk about endogenous economy. And you are close to one of the first uh, lecturers today, which didn't really talk about endogenous Africa. I mean cultural resources, I mean uh, handicraft, I mean traditional knowledges, which are in fact the economy where most of, of Africans are still involved in. We had the same bias when we were talking about religions, where uh, indigenous religion was absent, and it was just like Africans were either uh, Muslims or Catholics, etc. And we know that Africans can be both. They can be Muslim, they can be uh, uh, Christians, and ancestralists. So uh, I think we have a, a problem which is, uh, in fact, an epistemological problem. Thank you. Uh, the, the last, the last, no, uh, no, no, there's only one. I'm sorry. The last, the last question from the lady. Uh, 
you raise your hand, but I have unlimited. Listen, yeah, that, no, you can't listen. Listen, you can complain, but it's not going to change anything. Okay. <laughs> um, if I have to take everybody with their hands, we'll still be here, you know. And this is that. This is this is a it's a it's a five day conference. Okay, we will have time to converse on the thing. You know, this is about networking and this and that. You don't have to ask all the questions here. The last question. Okay. All right, the world is not fair, but you know. You know sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, oh, it's, it's okay, it's all right. It's a, okay. Okay, yes, um, please. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you, by 2050, um, who's going to feed Africa? And when I think about these questions, I'm thinking that it's the youth of today. And the youth of today is not going to use, for instance, um, the same technologies that exist today. So I wanted to know what are some of the possible solutions for catalyzing and sustaining an intensive agricultural transformation in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jomo, can you manage two minutes? Um, thank you very much, and uh, um, let, let me be try to cover uh, very interesting questions. I, I, I really cannot deal with the questions of uh, post-growth economics when um, the, the level of, of poverty is so great in Africa. Uh, to, to, to say that growth is not important I, is, is, is really not uh, beyond me. Uh, about um, the, the, the commodification of cultural resources, I guess you're not interested in the answer, so let, let me skip there. Uh, let, let me go to the uh, questions of, um, of budget support versus uh, project uh, aid. Um, it's, uh, there are very few African uh, Western com countries who gish, which give budget support. Okay, budget support basically is needed by African countries, especially the poorest African countries, and nobody gives them. Nobody gives budget support anymore. In the old days, when there was there were catastrophic situations, sometimes there was budget support. Hardly any budget support. It's not a Western versus non-Western aid issue at all. Now, um, on the question of FDI uh, um, of learning of 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 uh, learning from China, I, I think we you know it's very China is a huge country, and there are so many different types of investors from China. The Atlantic Council, the American Atlantic Council, recently published a report about the myths about Chinese investment. And one of the points they make is that not everything is being directed by the Politburo of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China. There's a lot of stuff which is going on by private investors which have nothing to do with the Chinese party or the, or the state. That's, uh, and another thing is that there are a variety of interests there's no monolithic Chinese, essentialist Chinese uh, 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 approach. And I think it's very important to remember the, the, the criticism uh, which was made by the former Chinese ambassador to Dar es Salaam, where he apologized uh, very greatly and very sincerely some, some, a few years ago uh, about the behavior of Chinese investors in Africa. Okay, so w when you take all this into consideration, I think you get a much more rich, much more balanced, and much more nuanced picture, you know, about the variety of behaviors associated with Chinese investors as well as with uh, with other investors. And and I think we should not we should go beyond uh, gross generalizations. But I think that the the point I wanted to make is that what China did has done very successfully has been to ensure that there was technology transfer, and they also made sure that the Chinese that, uh, were ready to learn very, very quickly and to do reverse engineering and various other things to master various technologies. Part of the problem right now with, between, the, between China and, and the US is that the Chinese have successfully learned, and now one of the fights is over the 5G technology. And you know, the, 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 without getting into the issues thereof, I think it's begin, it is very important to learn, to remember that the, late, the student can, 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 can 
can outdo the teacher. Okay, so th this is something which has to be learned. And so the question from the lady uh, who asked about where is food production going to come from in Africa? I don't have the answer, but the question is what are African countries doing to prepare themselves for these challenges? And I don't know the answer because I'm not in a position to discover the answer, but I think uh, I, I have spoken to, uh, to, I've spoken to um, uh, Ibrahim Mayaki, for example, at Nepad. He has been trying for quite some time with very modest success uh, to try to try to enhance uh, economic growth cap capacities and capabilities in Africa. And I do hope there is far greater cooperation and that Codestria can play a role in facilitating this kind of knowledge sharing uh, to enable uh, Africa to, 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 to progress. Um, the, uh, the, um, I think that, that those are the main issues uh, which, which have been raised. I, I think uh, the only other uh, point I would like to make is that I think we have a very huge opportunity right now uh, because I mean, we can all, you know, curse and, and blame Trump, Donald Trump, for everything. But I think one begins to realize that Mr. Trump, President Trump, is obsessed with American trade deficits. And this means that he's obsessed with China, Japan, Korea, Germany, Canada, and Mexico. And all the rest of us are irrelevant as far as he's concerned. So if you significantly increase your exports of, let us say, solar panels, I don't think he would give a damn. So these are the opportunities I think we have to recognize that we live in a very tough world. And in this very tough world, we have to rethink what are the opportunities we have to try to make do in this kind of situation. This is a, prob this is a challenge not only for Africa, it is a challenge for the rest of us in the South. And I'm glad the chair of the South Center is, is here with us because this is what the kind of thinking, pragmatic thinking, which is desperately needed, especially uh, all, all over, uh, in all the developing countries and that we can try to move forward together by learning from one another. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. I just wanted uh, <laughs> to say that uh, well, after Jomo's presentation, which illustrates uh, for the nth time, in a way, uh, the power of a system that renews itself and uh, continuously and to which we have to, to face up uh, uh, continuously. Uh, and that uh, our intellectuals, or our experts who, who have been formed in in, uh, in the schools of, of, of the 20th century, if you like, uh, are a little bit imprisoned in, in, in the box and the, in, the, um, in the categories that are imposed on us by the World Bank, by the IMF, by the other institutions of the international community, if you like. So uh, I think what is what we should require of ourselves is the power of imagination. I, t I take that, that expression very seriously. Uh, uh, and daring to think outside of, of these uh, boxes and uh, uh, to imagine alternatives outside of the boxes. And maybe one of the uh, uh, possibilities uh, for us to do that is to put more stress on the human sciences, on history, the study and the research, and uh, uh, the introduction of history into our curriculum, uh, uh, so as uh, 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 to give us this big perspective that, uh, uh, and to give our students and our sons and, and, and children uh, a larger perspective than what we received. I think it's, uh, what I want to, to say is really to push for uh, more human sciences and more history on our, uh, in our curriculum. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into any other intervention. We are already 24 minutes into the coffee break, you know, uh, and I apologize for people that I couldn't take. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have the next session. Um,
and I need to I need guidance from the organizers in terms of what happens to coffee break. If you ask me, we'll just continue to the next session. But then you're going to have tea and coffee and something you know unattended to on the other end. Uh, but maybe maybe we take about 15 minutes rather than 30 minutes for coffee break. Uh, but you know, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, panelists. Uh, since we have spoken.